Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this time and to this digital space. To say I am happy is an understatement because Shaheen is easily one of my most favorite people in this planet. I just love the work she does. I just love what she stands for, who she is as a person. I think her life and her work is a source of uh, lots of inspiration to me personally and to all of us in the School of Inspired Leadership. So thank you, Shine, for coming uh, on this particular program and thank you for doing this for us. Thank you. Thank you. So Shine, I just want to ask you to describe your own life story to begin with. You know, just share the story about your own life you tell yourself. Tell us your story. <laughs> That's a start, starting with a, a big bang, Anil, a very big question. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, you know, my, it's, it's easy to connect dots backwards. Yeah. Um, and, and when I look back now, I know many things have led to my mm -hmm. life story. But, but if I were just to tell you it going forwards. It's a very simple story. I grew up outside of India. Um, I used to visit India. Uh, I grew up with a lot of opportunity, a lot of privilege, um, and was very struck on my visits back to India um, with inequity from a very young age. And so from the age of 12, started doing a lot of volunteer work when I used to come back to India, but also in the different countries where we lived. And that led to at 18, this, this very um, heart-driven uh, instinct that, that sort of said, why, why not just move back to India? At the time, I was studying at Tufts University in the US, and so I dropped out of college, um, walked into one of the large low-income communities in Mumbai, um, and started teaching. And that experience of teaching and working with kids really was the, the real start of my journey. Um, I was 18. At that age, I started uh, my first organization called Akanksha, um, which means aspiration. And for 17 years, um, built Akanksha, did a lot of direct work with children, um, got a lot of love from the children, learned pretty much everything I think I know today from my children. Um, and then 17 years later, founded a second organization called Teach for India, um, really with the aim of building a movement of leaders across the country, um, dedicated to, to solving a singular goal of inequity in education uh, for India's children. So that's, I guess, the, the short version of the story, Anil. How oh, very nice, Shaheen. Now, tell me, what was that moment that you recall when this idea of Teach for India was born in your heart? Could you describe just a moment or what actually happened? Yeah. So actually, with Akanksha, there was a more um, specific moment, um, which I'll share briefly, where um, I was visiting India and I was in a taxi um, in Mumbai at a traffic light and a few kids ran up to the car and they were begging. Um, and in that moment, I sort of questioned, um, what am I doing and why am I not doing something here in India with children? And that's what led to me dropping out of college, et cetera. So that's like a specific moment that I remember. With Teach for India, I think it was more a very gradual realization um, being part of the lives of many children and their education, that education just profoundly changes lives. I think we all know that and we read that, but when you see it in children that you've worked with, um, I felt very, very compelled to then do that at scale. So Teach for India was really about a, a question to self that said, if this is possible, if children can really change in such fundamental ways, um, then how do we do it at scale? And that's what sort of led me to shift from Akanksha to Teach for India. That's very nice. Now tell me, in this whole time when you 
have worked from a young teenager or in fact even preteens you were 12 when something started to happen in your heart and you were drawn towards this work and then you said i want to be part of the solution i just don't want to talk about the problem in all this work and all these years what stands out in your memory are the moments when you were at your happiest best when you and your people worked together to do something which was yeah. your happiest best i mean my happiest moments have been working directly with children um i think the kind of feeling you get when you uh take a class and everybody is learning and laughing and loving learning um there is something magical about those moments and um so i think that's where i've been my happiest in just seeing like kids learning with joy and learning with meaning and and when i say learning with meaning i mean not learning for marks and exams and subjects but learning because they believe that those skills are going to enable them to change their yeah yeah i think uh, we are facing some uh, difficulty with shine's uh, internet and she should be back but for the benefit of everybody i first met shine i first heard about shine when um, we were um, doing work with the social sector when i was the founder of aisha consultancy and then as founder of the grow talent company there was always this part in our companies that we wanted to take responsibility for the way we live now and so there was always this thought that we don't just have to you know talk about running an organization for just serving our stakeholders for example customers employees and other kinds of stakeholders but we so their shine is back so you know that's the time i first heard about uh, shine's work and i just uh, wanted to call out that uh, when we called uh, shine to come together when we were launching the school of inspired leadership in delhi she not only came she wrote a wonderful poem that she recited which deeply touched my heart and the hearts of the 4 500 people who had gathered and so that was something really magical as uh, my happiest moment with shine there have been more than one but i wanted to describe that while we lost her because of this uh, power failure or whatever happened there yeah shine please please go ahead and describe you said you were really happy in the classroom when you saw joy and you saw meaning both so please talk about that yeah, yeah i i was just i was just going to add anil that to me um education itself understanding its power as a tool i think we've lost that understanding uh, in most schools across our country um we've made it very much about self um and the livelihood that i want and that's an important part of education but i think education as being about learning to respect and love others to uplift others to make the world better when i've seen those moments and children of all ages excited about the role that they can play in making the world better i think those have been my real goosebump moments hmm. could you describe uh, i have heard many stories uh, from your colleagues and others i had the privilege of mentoring one of your teach for india fellows i have heard so many inspiring stories but can you single out some project or something that you did together which had a huge impact on all of you yeah i mean i have a i have a recency bias and so um yeah. as you spoke the beautiful thing about the work that i do is these stories unfold literally minute by minute and i'm just thinking about a message i got 2 days ago um from one of our students um who has actually um created for the visually impaired 
um, an online uh, tutorial so that they don't require a scribe anymore. And he's infused in his own words, a lot of love and compassion into that platform. Um, and then just again, yesterday, um, I'm working with a small group of children who are creating educational videos without any prior knowledge for other kids. So we're experimenting with blended learning in this post-COVID world. And this young girl, Nemeth, um, has created, she feels very passionately about being safe at home. And she's created a video for other children on what does it mean um, to be safe at home using like graphics and statistics and her own uh, understanding. So every day like that, there are examples. But if you were to ask me about a big project that really shifted my life, I would go back eight years um, to a musical that we did called Maya. Um, I'm a big believer that the intersection of the arts, um, the development of character education and academics are a very powerful combination. So with Maya, we took a group of children um, on an 18 month journey of practicing courage, compassion and wisdom. And the journey was going to culminate in a Broadway style musical. We actually managed to contact a Broadway music director who got all of the, the music written for the musical, et cetera. So it ended up being a fantastic project and show. But more than that, what we learned defines an excellent education. The small practices, the building of community, the importance of relationships, the importance of holding the highest bar possible for children. These things really shifted how we thought about education. So I think that project really stands out. That's amazing. And that must have been very exciting to get the music, to get a world sort of producer to be with you, to get all yeah. children involved. Yeah. Also, the intercultural sort of uh, learning in that must have been amazing. So can you share a little Absolutely. bit more as to what actually happened? Can you describe to us? Yeah, some? I mean, so it was an original script that I wrote about a princess called Maya who was in search of her greatest potential. And she used these three values of courage, compassion, and wisdom to find her potential. Um, so I wrote the original story. We gave it to a Broadway script writer. He turned it into a script. We got a range of different people to come to India to work with the children from circus trainers to jazz musicians to trained kids who were not able to hit a note when we started to sing the whole Broadway um, musical themselves. Um, we did all kinds of things uh, linked to the three values. So for courage, for example, none of our kids had ever been swimming. We made them all get into the pool and we said, you have to overcome your fear of water. For compassion, we took them to an old age home and we said, what does it mean to connect with somebody who is very different from you, from very different background uh, from you. We went out on Whirly Sea Face one day and we said, random acts of kindness, everyone go and hug somebody and experiment with what that looks like. So we did a lot of beautiful things and it culminated in 10 performances, all to packed houses, um, all touch wood, got standing ovations, I think where um, we were able to demonstrate, I think that with high quality opportunity, a child's background can be overcome. Like it does not need to determine his or her destiny. And I think that's really what the, the vision of the project was. Oh, we more nice. recently, Anil did another big project where we did a circus performance called The Greatest Show on Earth, um, where we, we transformed the circus into the education system in the country. And this was a very unique performance because we got children, uh, children's own stories to become the script of the story. How very nice. How very nice. And what did you discover in this team of wonderful people who work with you? What kind of strengths emerged from your own team at that time? What did you discover about I mean, them? I don't know how to say enough wonderful things about my team. I, you would probably just say the same about your team. And I know we're all very biased towards our teams, but I'm certainly a believer that I have the best team in the entire world. And the reason I say that, and not just my immediate team, but the Teach for India community, the level of care and compassion 
for each other and for those who need it is just unparalleled. Like anybody in our community floats a need. Someone's father is unwell. Somebody, you know, doesn't have enough money right now because their COVID has struck the family. And the, the, the community just rallies around um, for emotional support, for physical support, for financial support. So, so I think one defining characteristic is just compassion um, and love, I would say, for each other. I think another defining characteristic is just an immense sense of possibility um, that it doesn't matter, like throw us challenges and, and we will overcome. And to see young fellows, um, Teach for India fellows, 22, 23 years old, being confronted by so many issues that poverty throws up. They'll have children in their class who are being sexually abused, who have lost a parent, whose parents are unemployed, who don't have access to technology. And yet, they just try to find a way and they keep going. So the, the sense of possibility and the relentless working, I think these are some of the, the defining characteristics. That's very nice. What did you discover as your own gifts while doing this work? What is that uniqueness about you, Shine? What are you blessed with? What's the talent that you discovered in yourself that you leverage? Yeah, I mean, I think my biggest, I mean, I, I would say my two, I think, biggest talents. One is like, basically by heart, I'm a, like a foolish dreamer. Like, it, it's very easy for me to dream. And to me, like, it doesn't even really matter if I get fully there. Just the, the ability to work towards something that is big and bold and ambitious and beautiful is something that comes very naturally to me. So I think big ideas, um, big dreams. Um, I, I tend to live a little bit in, in, a, in a fairy tale world and have learned over time that it's very important to be uh, equally grounded in the truth. Um, but dreaming, I think, would be one. And I think the second is really creativity. Um, I love innovation. I love to do things differently. I don't like to repeat. I like to innovate. I'm very comfortable with change. Um, I'm very comfortable throwing away something I've done and said, you know, I can do it better. Um, so I think those would be two of two of my my gifts. And you know, I I see some of my own gifts in what uh, you talk about, and you know, therefore uh, I see a bit of myself in in you, and therefore I want to ask a question. Uh, Sometimes those of us who are dreamers and those of us who are more creative, we require other kinds of people to make up for things that we don't necessarily have. And so what, what is a conscious attempt you do to bring others who sort of complement you and complete you in that sense? Yeah, I mean, that is the learning, what you just said, right? And it, it, I think for many years, you try to surround yourself with people like you because it's easier and you realize it's a disaster. Like you don't need people like you around you, you need people different. I think it's just that realization, Anil, after that, like the actions are, are pretty straightforward. But right now, like I just love the balance on our team because there are people who are just so pragmatic and realistic and there are people who are operational and there are people who are um, more dreamers and like the discussions we have. And then of course, holding the value of dissent um, and dialogue at the same time. I think the combination of a diverse team, but also the ability to dialogue openly and create safe spaces for people to share, that combination is powerful. It's been a big learning for me over time. Um, it's happened very slowly, um, but I, I certainly feel extremely grateful today um, to the people around me who are very, very different from me. How nice. You know, you have many supporters and admirers. One of them is Nosher Kurodi, who is also incidentally with his daughter Kurshid in this webinar. And uh, Nosher was recounting very lovingly and fondly how he managed to create some space in the office for you. And which really is a question that uh, I was about to ask you, how do you manage to get people on board your mission? You know, whether it's corporates or it is this wonderful talent uh, that comes to you. They all want to volunteer. Some of the best of the best uh, people in the country want to come and volunteer with you. 
and how has yeah. that happened? Yeah, I mean, so firstly, like Noshir is, that, that's a bit of an understatement. What Noshir did for us was give Akanksha a home for the last 30 years. Like we're still there. So it was sort of unbelievable what he did for us. Um, but I think two, two responses, uh, Anil, both quite different to your question. Um, the first is I, I often think that this work is a little bit like just being a professional beggar. Like you're just constantly asking people shamelessly for what you want. And in the beginning, you feel a little bad and then you realize you're not asking for yourself. You're asking for really important reasons. And so you have to ask. And so my own journey, whether it was being able to ask for money or being able to ask people to give time, now I'm at a point where I almost feel like I'm offering you an opportunity when I'm asking. I'm not even like, you know, I'm giving you a chance to engage in this incredible work of changing people's lives. So that's been my journey from a lot of hesitation and nervousness to ask for things to saying let me like jump in and ask because the maximum someone can say is no and if I ask enough times like someone will say yes actually my younger daughter Sana when she was five years old she taught me this lesson because she just would relentlessly ask for chocolate like wherever we were she would go to strangers and you know, people would be a little dubious, like a five-year-old coming to a stranger. So most people would say no, but she would not stop until she got the chocolate. And eventually <laughs> she asked enough people to get the chocolate. So I think you learn a lot from, from your kids. So that's one part of the answer. The second in how we made it aspirational, I think Anil is a sort of deeper answer, which is like, it has to be aspirational. Like what we're asking people to do is the most important thing in the world. Like I genuinely believe that. I'm putting you in a position of power and authority where you can change positively or damage children's lives. And so we need our most committed, we need our most loving, we need our most thoughtful people in our classrooms, and we need them to go on beyond the two years and really shape the way education happens. So I think part of how we attract people is because we have that belief that we really need the best people, we set our bar very high. So we say it's okay if we don't meet our recruitment numbers, but we're not gonna lower our bar on what we believe it takes to be excellent in a classroom. Um, and I think you know that, that also has been a learning. I mean, the first year when we started Teach for India, I was terrified. I was like, nobody's gonna join this program. Like, why would you graduate from a top school and come and teach in a government school? Like, you've not been conditioned to think in that way. And I would very nervously go onto college campuses. I'd have a hundred people in front of me and I'd take a deep breath and I'd remember, but our kids are precious. They need the best people. And I would look out at those hundred people and I'd say, you know, maybe 10% of you are interested in Teach for India and probably 1% of you is good enough for Teach for India because that's what our kids deserve. And I think it worked, Anil, you know, it worked like keeping the bar high, saying we need the best people um, and then sharing a lot of stories over the years, because then it becomes easier when you know other people have made the leap, you can identify with them and then it becomes easier for you to make the leap as well. And you also managed to convince some of the top companies in the country to uh, send their own talent on a sabbatical to work with you. How did that happen? Similarly, I mean, like, why would you not do that? I mean, imagine the people you're getting back two years later, right? They're coming back with such diverse experiences fueled by so much contribution. They're bringing that spirit back into your company. Like, again, it just feels to me like a lot of these things are win-win. And when you approach conversations in that way, I think people respond to them very differently than thinking that, you're asking them to make a big sacrifice. What a nice way to say it. You know, our spiritual teacher, Swami Chinmayananda, often said, he said the reward for uh, seva or service is more service. Yeah. And he, he said that is the real reward. It is not anything else that actually if you are found good enough to serve more, uh, that's the reward. So that's what you're also saying, that uh, the work itself is the reward. There is no yeah. other reward you require. And it is such a fulfilling thing that, that to say. Now tell me, how, how do you see the uh, 
the scale of this now, you know, for many of our uh, people in this webinar may not be aware of the size and scale of what Teach for India does. So can you give us some idea about how many children are being impacted and how many fellows are working at one time? Sure. I mean, you know, it is amongst the largest fellowship programs um, in the country. So we bring in a, a new cohort of 500 fellows each year. So at any given point, we have 900 to 1,000 fellows teaching. Um, but that's still a tiny drop in the ocean, Anil, which is the other side of that truth, right? So our, our fellows today are teaching about 32,000 children across seven cities um, and across about 350 schools. Our alumni base, so these are people who've completed the two-year fellowship. Um, we now have about 3,000 500 alumni, over 70% of whom have stayed full-time in education. And that's really where we see the scale. So our alumni collectively are impacting about 20 million children in wow. different ways, directly and indirectly. So you really see the multiplier because they work at the curriculum textbook. Yeah, that, that's absolutely amazing because, you know, to, to have the alumni of Teach for India are working with two crores, uh, 20 million children. That's a very large scale. 20, yeah. mil, 20 million children is a very large scale. And I know the power today is uh, playing truant in Mumbai, which I'm surprised you are a Tata power uh, place. No, I I'm, in, I'm in Pune and I'm oh, sorry. I'm yeah. now in the dark, but luckily the my phone internet is still working. So it should yeah. come back. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think we can still see you and we can hear you. That is uh, very, very nice. So two million people. Wow, that's that's really large scale. That's really wonderful that it's impacting two million people. Yeah, that's Anil, about 20 million. Actually. Yeah, sorry, 20 million. Yeah, two yeah, crores. Yeah. That's what I corrected myself. Yeah, yeah. I, I said in your absence when you went away, I told our audience that it is two crores. That's a very yeah. large scale, actually. That's amazing. Now, one thing... How do you see this movement developing? Because it is a movement. It's not just an organization. This is a huge movement. How do you see yeah. this developing in the future? Yeah. So we have so many dreams, Anil. I, I think, um, you know, at our core is the idea of leadership development, that we want to um, develop leaders for inequity in education specifically to work across the system. And so that will continue to be the idea that will fuel us, that we need one day, hopefully, someone in the home ministry and education ministers and CEOs and all to be Teach for India alumni working together to get an excellent education to all kids. So we think a lot about system change through talent and putting the right people into the right places. So that's sort of our core. Um, at the same time, our real next dream is to say, how do we bring our children in and have them be at the forefront of the movement? So what would it mean for Teach for India children to graduate, become Teach for India fellows, and then enter the movement and work alongside us? So that's a big dream that we have. How do we get our, our children um, to be strong enough that they will get through our selective process um, and be able to work alongside us. And I think that will be a game changer for how we think about education. And then the third part of the dream is I think Teach for India has been quite successful in pushing the bar on innovation. And so really thinking about, I mean, today we have more than 50 different organizations that our alumni have started in the field of education. Um, so, so really encouraging entrepreneurship in education, innovation, pushing the envelope on what is the very purpose of education, advocating for that differently. Um, right now we're, we're piggybacking on a beautiful campaign that Vishal and Sucheta from Dream a Dream have started called What If? And the campaign invites you to say in this time of COVID, let's not just run and sort of plug gaps, but let's stop, pause, breathe, and really reimagine what education could look like. Um, and so that's something we're very actively involved in right now. So advocacy, really changing the way people talk about what education needs to be is also a part of the dream. Oh, very nice. 
Now, one I know for my work because I also serve as the chair of a large school in Delhi, and I'm also involved with other educational institutions, including our own. And uh, I have always found a critical aspect of school and the learning outcomes and education is the quality of leadership of the school principal. You know, so how are you looking at that? Because if the school principals are of the right quality and if they have the right leadership, the whole environment changes in the school. So is there some particular initiative that you and your colleagues are thinking of, of developing yeah. the right quality of leaders as school principals? Yeah, so so lucky a large number own alumni get very excited about school leadership as well and go on and become those school principals. So that's very exciting. Um, but for the schools where we place fellows, these are government schools or some of the lowest income private schools. And we come into schools where we don't know the leadership. And so we have leadership across the spectrum. I think the intention is to work with the system in partnership with the system. So one initiative we have that's very beautiful is a is a free online teacher training portal called Firki, firki.co and it's available for all teachers and all school leaders as a way to develop professionally so whatever we learn and we, we source a lot of fantastic stuff from others in the education environment curate it very carefully and put it on Firki. so we're trying different ways to bring our schools along and to make sure that as we learn, they learn, and as they learn, we learn from them as well. Okay. One last question before we, there are already lots of questions coming from the audience. So my one last question to you, what are you reading from this COVID crisis and what is coming to you as its impact? And therefore what kind of role should all the young people who are listening to you be playing today in the midst of this crisis? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say on that, Anil. I mean, firstly, just a, a really um, heartfelt hope that everyone on this call is able to stay on the right side of hope and optimism at this time, because I think the way COVID has affected all of us is probably not even fully known to all of us, you know, it's, it's affecting us at levels that we see and probably at multiple levels that we don't even know. So the first thing I would say is just a lot of self-compassion is needed at this time, like not to feel bad. There are a hundred million things to do. Teach for India itself has launched into a massive relief effort and taken on all kinds of additional things, blended learning for the first time, but looking after ourselves, looking after our people, holding spaces for our well-being, making sure meetings start with really knowing how people are. I think all of this has been very, very, very important. Um, the second has been like a little bit of what I said, like helping people stay on the right side of optimism. Like my, my dear friend Craig said it so beautifully the other day. He showed us an image of a dark tunnel with a light at the end. And he said it's COVID is very much like we're stuck in this dark tunnel and it's overwhelming and it's, it's just dark. And yet we have to remember that there is the light at the end of the tunnel and make sure that we don't go backwards um, as we move forward, but really use it as an opportunity to leverage what is beautiful. So today, for example, I was on a call with some of our Chennai Teach for India fellows and they've all started experimenting with blended learning for kids who like don't even have access to technology. So they're finding devices, they're sharing devices there, but so much excitement in their voices to figure it out. So much curiosity, spirit of learning. And, and I would say that, I think that's what's needed at this time, looking after ourselves and then a curiosity to make things better and to take small steps forward um, when the, the the, uh, there is, we feel compelled to race forward because there's so much to do. But I would say small steps, look after yourself and know that you can make things better over time. Wonderful. So now I'll open it up to the questions. So Sabrish, who's one of our students is asking, how do you see the future of education in reaching the nook and corner of India? And how is India going to be unique amongst the world in our education in the future? Yeah, 
I mean, what a beautiful question. I, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. I mean, that's just, I think we all have to do our bit. I don't know how we're going to get education to every nook and cranny. My best bet in that answer is embracing the idea of partnership. Um, and, you know, the, the beautiful African concept of Ubuntu, that it takes a village to raise a child and we all need to work together. How do we work with our students, with our parents, with civil society, with government um, to say we need to do this together? How do we infuse enough will? I think there are enough resources in the country. Um, we just need to have the will to allocate the resources, to allocate the importance that education actually deserves. So my, my first and most immediate answer would just be partnership. Um, my second would be just let's get the purpose of education right. You know, I mean, while foundational learning is of supreme importance and we have to get all kids to learn to read and write to uplift them out of poverty, it's not enough. And how do we make sure that we're building for kids to not just have a livelihood, but to be happy, to be at peace with themselves, others and the world? Narendra Paul, who is from the Chinmaya Organization of Rural Development, you know, they are doing massive work on rural development and also doing work in education for the underprivileged children. They host in their training center in Sidbari near Dharamshala, the annual retreat of uh, the Teach for India Fellows. So every year for the last four years, they have been hosting you there. And so he asked a question. He said, what are the key motivators that can help teachers in government schools in India to source the same joy and inspiration from within because uh, your fellows coming and doing it is a great idea, but how can their teachers source this joy and inspiration? How can they be helped to do yeah. that? You know, my, the thing I think the most about it, I was just actually on a call before this with my own leadership team talking about where Teach for India wants to be 10 years from now. And what I was saying is if there's one thing we need to do, it's to infuse love into education. And that would be my answer to that question. I think we need to love our teachers. We need to respect them. We need to love them. We need to care for them. We need to make sure that their cup is full. And if their cup is full, then they are going to let that cup overflow um, to their students. But I think what we've done to the profession of teaching in our country is we have not valued and we have taken our teachers for granted and we've made teaching a very transactional exercise and we've not given them the things that we know fuel the human spirit, um, freedom and choice and validation and value. Um, and I think it's at that fundamental level of culture that we really need to rebuild the profession of teaching. Thank you. A dear friend, Aran Nair, the former Unilever board member uh, and an executive coach, he said, do you have any insights from research work being carried out on teacher beliefs and motivation? That it's like that typical George Bernard Shaw Pygmalion effect. You know, teacher, you consider that I was smart. And I don't know, Shine, you must have heard of this horrendous research done in the early 60s that in a classroom, a teacher was told that this class is full of very bright students and the other teacher was told that this is all students with below a certain IQ and every year the same teacher was promoted as the class teacher of the class. Horrendous experiment done on children but 10 years later the children who you know what so called the brighter called you know children they all excelled and the children who actually were supposed to be with low IQs dropped out of school but actually there was no difference between the two. This was yeah. an experiment done on teacher beliefs. So you must have heard about this horrendous experiment. So, yeah. so RR is asking something uh, similar that yeah. uh, do you, any research done on that? And do you have any insights about that? Yeah, I mean, every single example that we've seen has reinforced the idea that you just absolutely have to have high expectations of all children. Um, and that kids will rise to the expectations that we set for them. Um, and in fact, setting a bar 
in and of itself is a problem because kids will only reach that bar. And so how do you make sure that your bar for children is just constantly evolving and getting pushed up and that you are not the limiting factor? You know, I think often as adults, with all good meaning, we're telling kids, no, but really, will you be able to? Like kids are able to, and we have to like believe that they can do what they say in their hearts that they want to do. Um, and I think there's just absolutely compelling research around the world to show that. But in our own experience at Teach for India, we have never seen the converse to be true. That when people have had low expectations, kids have never done well. Um, and so I would say it's, it's been one of our, our biggest learnings that have high expectations. You know, once I walked into a classroom of ours in Hyderabad, a kid ran out very excited and said, Didi, I need to show you my dreams. And he pulled out a 10 page full scap um, essay that he had written both sides of the paper. And it was 10 pages of dreams of what he wanted to change in India. And, you know, being an adult, my first instinctive result was, let me tell this kid, like, maybe you should prioritize. And I said, no, like, who knows? Maybe this kid's going to go out and, like, achieve these dreams. And who am I to say no to this child? And I think we need to be really careful. We need to start with a yes, you know, and not a yes, but, but just a yes. Yes, try. If you don't make it, it's okay, but try. What a nice, uh, what a nice answer. Thank you. Thank you, Shine. Uh, you know, you're getting lots of uh, positive appreciation and feedback from a number of people. So, but uh, let me focus on some critical questions. Uh, Ravi M is asking how parents can influence children differently to prepare them for being better citizens because all the social media noise around them. You know, so how, how can you, parents play an important role in making good citizens out of our children? Yeah, such a beautiful question. I mean, the role of parents is so critical. I mean, I think the first and most obvious one goes back to our, our dear Gandhiji's, like, be the change you wish to see in the world, or in this case, in your children. Um, you as a role model, right? If you're a caring citizen, um, your kids are going to grow up um, being that. And there have been so many times when I've cringed um, stopping at a traffic light to see a child run up to a window and someone put the window up in that child's face. Um, and what does that mean? And what message are you sending to the child in the car as well about our common humanity? So how do we raise our children and telling them that especially in a world like today where fear is such a real thing, right? My, my dear friend Kiran Sethi was saying the other day that we've the one thing that used to connect us, the smile, that is also gone with the facial mask, right? So fear is such a real thing in that world. How do we remember to talk about and demonstrate that? No, but we are one and we all matter. So that's, that's one. And I think the second is just little, little experiences um, that you give your children from a very young age to interact with people different from them, to see glimpses of the truth um, of the world, to be able to contribute to positive change. Like for me, it was small things. Looking after animals growing up, I think taught me compassion. Volunteering in my summer vacations gave me such rich and diverse experiences. Um, so creating those real world experiences for our children, I think makes a very, very big difference. Now, Samir uh, Kumar is asking this question that how can uh, one develop one's emotional intelligence? And are there any particular articles to read or any podcasts, anything specific that you can recommend to improve emotional intelligence? Yeah. You know, I don't read as much as I should. There's a ton of stuff out there um, about emotional intelligence. But I really think that it gets developed by just doing and caring um, and looking after just the people around you. Like one like tiny example, I'm, I'm, I've been locked down in Pune, which is not actually my home. And outside uh, where I stay, there are about, there must be 35 or 40 stray dogs on that one road. Um, and of course, during the lockdown, 
there's been no one to feed them. So we go out every night at 10 o'clock to feed these dogs. And the kind of things that have shifted um, in us from this daily experience of feeding the dogs, it's so beautiful. Um, and I think whatever you feel called to do, like your emotional intelligence will develop through asking yourself, like, what do I feel called to shift? And don't make it something very big because then it becomes very overwhelming and there's a hundred reasons why you can't do it. But but just take that step. And I, I think your emotional intelligence grows with that. Very nice. Uh, one of our students, uh, Shivani Bhatnagar, is asking, how can education leverage this crisis? Uh, do you think uh, there is a need to step back and rethink the delivery of education? Yeah. I mean, my short answer and my current obsession, um, so I'm so grateful for the question, is blended learning, I think, can be the, the equalizer. Like, if we do it well, and by blended learning, I mean um, traditional classroom teaching plus learning to be a teacher of the virtual classroom, right? If we put that together, if that becomes the new normal, especially for kids who come from backgrounds of disadvantage, suddenly you change everything. Because in the past, a high income child got the best teacher, the best resources, the best education. Um, and if you happen to land up in a good classroom with a good teacher, you got a good education. But today, like education is at your fingertips if you have access. So if we can solve the problem of access, um, and commit to that. And literally, like we give out textbooks in government schools, we should be giving out tablets and internet because that's going to enable our most disadvantaged children to have access to the world's greatest ideas, greatest stories, greatest teachers. And that can be an absolute game changer. So I feel very, very excited. We're full throw experimenting with all of this right now at Teach for India, hoping to learn a lot through this year um, and, and facing the really difficult questions of access to technology and what do we do when kids don't have it, um, but taking it on and learning about that. Very nice. Olivia Deka, who is one of her students, is currently living with a current TFI fellow. And she says that we've been discussing last few days, it's all about coming up with ideas on how to help the kids who are currently on the verge of dropping out. And TFI is, of course, she loves TFI. And she says that uh, this uh, person she's staying with, Shivakshi Bhattacharya, is working 24 by 7 since the you know CAA and NRC protests to the current pandemic situation to help these kids. And uh, she says that it uh, truly empowers uh, the people. And uh, so, and she also said she read recently how you need to look towards changing the C. That means from C, COVID to the C, we wish to see right. in the children. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. So, talk a bit more can, about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you for that thought, firstly. And I keep hoping that my fellows are okay through all of this because. They have so much love in their hearts and they work so hard and I worry about them in the process as well. Um, but the, the article she's referring to is, is um, really our 10 years of our work at Teach for India has led us over time to believe that there are eight C's, they all start with C, um, that are really critical for kids to be successful in their lives and happy. Um, and, and those C's are commonly defined as, as the 21st century skills as well. And then we've added our own. Um, so they are courage. Um, how do kids actually have the ability to face their fears um, and do what they really believe in? Uh, they are compassion. How do kids grow up caring for others? They are creativity and critical thinking. How do we, in the post-COVID world, um, really enable our kids to find solutions, even when it's difficult. Their communication and the power today of using communication as a tool to raise my voice and to listen to others with respect. Um, they are curiosity. How can I be a curious learner today? Because again, learning is at my fingertips, but I have to want to seek that learning. 
um, and they are collaboration. How do we work together with others? So what we're sort of saying is if we develop these in us as educators and we develop these in our children um, and, and use our content to build these skills, use our culture to build these skills and use our opportunities to build these skills, then we will move uh, far ahead. So the argument I was making in the article was let's not make the biggest C COVID, let's make the biggest C the development of skills that will help us in a post COVID world. Very nice. Now, Adi Sharma is asking, how do you keep people around you motivated and inspired despite so many obstacles and conflict? I mean, it's so, it's so counterintuitive, but I actually think that when you have a mission that really matters to people, that challenges become the motivator. Like I actually think that the reason our fellows work so hard is because they see the struggles of their kids. And if they didn't see those struggles, like the combination of seeing the struggle and loving the children together um, is the motivator. And so sometimes I think we feel nervous um, about whether people can handle challenge. But in my experience, people have an immense capacity to care and to handle challenge um, and to motivate themselves towards something of purpose for them. Um, and, and I think that's the key, like find something you really care about. And if you're able to articulate that North Star for people and they resonate with it, the motivation comes. Uh, along with it. And of course, motivation is a very complex thing, right? It goes up and down for all of us. So I think the other part of this is how do you ensure everyone has a support system and a community around them that keeps pulling them up when they get demotivated? Um, and we think of that very seriously. Like, does every fellow have a support system? Does every student in Teach for India have a community and a support system that can inspire them, support them, and challenge them and hold them accountable. Hitesh Kataria, who works with the Mahindra Group on sustainability, and he's uh, from the first batch of soil, you know whom you actually, when you launched soil, you came with us, so he's from that opening batch. He says, in these difficult times, we have seen responsible companies stepping up and donating for healthcare. And Economic Times talked about donations uh, going up to 7,000 crores. And he said, this is amazing, but it also means that resources are getting exhausted for other causes. So in this circumstances, what are the other funding alternatives for people in other causes? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for bringing this point into the conversation, Anil. It's, it's a very, very, very important question. Um, because while, of course, COVID needs and deserves huge amounts of, of funding. Um, it has never been as difficult for social sector organizations to even meet their current budgets. Teach for India still hasn't met this year's budget. Um, and fun funding gets diverted um, and it's been really tough. And I think Teach for India is in a relatively more stable position then a lot of younger organizations that are, are at risk of just going on during this time. And so what we've been doing is really making a very heartfelt appeal to people to say, like, we have to hold the end on this. Like, we have to give more and we have to give for COVID. But we have to remember that by not giving for basic education and, and, and basic security, we're going to create a second wave of problems that is potentially even larger than the problems we're facing today. Um, and our people are going to need that. I mean, I, I struggle today to convince donors who want to give food relief. Um, and uh, like today I'm saying, okay, but I've raised enough money for food relief. What I need money for is data and tabs for kids because they can't access learning. And donors are saying, no, but we want to give money for food relief, you know? So I think it's been really, really difficult. I think the opportunity right now for social sector organizations, apart from just being smart and cutting your budgets wherever, just being more cost efficient, where we've had to cut, cut our budget quite significantly this year, is to really leverage retail fundraising. I think we've never lived in a time where like everybody wants to give and, and is quite compelled to give. Um, 
And so how do you run crowdsourcing? You know, we, we put a fundraiser on, on Milap for our families. We've managed to feed more than 5,000 families using that money already. Um, so I found retail fundraising to be something that people are very open to at this time. Very good. Monica Tata from uh, Portugal. She's one of, uh, you know, the very committed to environment and so on. She says that, thank you for the insights. And she says, um, how do we share with our children the unschooling of the social conditioning in order to promote their access to their natural creativity and reconnect with nature, understanding we are nature? So beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, it's such a complex and difficult question. I think the most ideal is for kids to be in nature and to be able to see and to learn and to know that nature is our greatest teacher. And that becomes so tough when you're stuck in like an urban, large Indian city and kids are literally not seeing nature um, around them and, and in some ways only seeing the difficult parts of nature and where nature is breaking down. Um, I think it's just a lot of exposure and a lot of dialogue um, that is going to help break down some of that conditioning. So one of the C's I forgot to mention, one of the most important ones is consciousness. Um, and Anil, you'd be able to relate a lot to this as well, but how do we make sure that education strengthens your awareness of self, other, and the world? And my understanding is that action shifts when awareness shifts. Um, and awareness shifts often through exposure and through dialogue um, and through being able to create and hold really safe spaces for kids to express um, themselves openly. Thank you. I think Indranara is asking and she is very troubled by the fact that the apparently highly educated and so-called intelligent people, when these migrants were being impacted, Many of the people were not sensitive to the plights of our fellow countrymen. And she said that, you know, how can we bring about this kind of sensitivity in people that it's not just about their having enough food and their being secure, but how can you develop this kind of uh, sensitivity and social consciousness amongst people so that they listen to their own inner voice? Yeah. I mean... I think the only way to do it is to, again, help fill people, um, if that makes sense, Anil. I, I found that, again, counterintuitively, people who, are, who, who appear to act in ways that are not compassionate and not caring, I think are the most needy of love and care and compassion. And I found that that is what shifts people, you know, like our tendency if we're a teacher in a classroom is to get very upset with the child who is misbehaving or is acting out or who is hitting another child, but it's just a plea for help and care. And I found that when you respond in a different way than someone would expect you to respond. So someone will expect you to fight back or to get upset with them or to reprimand them. And when you counterintuitively respond with love and compassion, then maybe you gift that person something that they can uh, pay forward. And it's a very slow process and it's not a, you know, uphill. It's, it's very much a, a roller coaster, but I found that that helps. I, I don't know which poem you were referring to, Anil, but I remember writing a poem um, uh, several years ago after an incident where it was such a small, simple example where a little kid ran up to me, wanted money. I didn't want to give her money. She pointed to coconuts on the road and she said, can you buy me a coconut? I thought, what a smart little child, you know, asking for something healthy. I can't possibly say no. And so I went and bought her a coconut. We were sitting down on the road. She was drinking a coconut. I was drinking a coconut and a very well-dressed man was walking by sort of looking at us very like a little bit like suspiciously and then finally he came over 
and almost embarrassed, took an apple out of his pocket and gifted it to this child. And it was such a simple thing. But I was thinking that probably he's wanted to do that for so long, but it just took seeing somebody else doing it to, to tell him that, oh, it's okay, I can do it too. Um, and it made me so happy that moment. And so I think sometimes when we don't see it, let's just give that same thing in, in greater measure to that person and maybe something will shift. How nice. You know, I'm in the webinar, my uh, cousin, uh, Bina Singh, India's first mechanical engineer from, I, from IIT. Uh, her daughter, uh, Malika Singh, is, I think, known to you in Mumbai, Acumen Fund and so on. And she was telling me how, you know, she's now a senior citizen, but she was so excited, like a little child saying, I want to listen to Shaheen and all her wonderful thoughts. So even a, you know, a 70 plus sister of mine was so excited listening to you because of the work that you do. And of course, Bina, Bina herself has done amazing work. She's also been in public life. She's done some amazing, amazing work. But I was just saying from a senior citizen to a young student in soil, we were all so excited today. We are not just listening to another chairman of a board or CEO, but we are listening to Shine Mystery, the one who stands for Teach for India. And you know, so Shine, your presence is uh, full of unconditional love. Uh, your alternate thinking, your way of looking at the world in, in its entirety. I was touched by the story of 10 p.m. I almost was with you in the street feeding those trays. You know, so it was just amazing to see the, the way you put it all together and the way you articulate it and the way your energy comes out and the way you feel for each and every person, including the way you said how you are feeling for all your Teach for India fellows and imagining how they are because you, you literally want to touch each one of them. So thank you for your humanity. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your compassion and thank you for your creativity. I think you've done us a huge honor by coming here today. Thanks oh, a lot. Thank you for this beautiful space and thanks to all the people for listening. It's so difficult not to be able to see people, um, but to know that people uh, were there listening uh, so beautifully. So thank you, Anil. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much. And next week, we will be back with Niren Chaudhary, the global CEO of Panera Bread. And with him, we will have another wonderful conversation. Thank you very much.